And um, to help uh, tease out some of the features of the text, I'm going to read uh, Colossians 3. Actually, I'm going to try and do it from memory, because I did memorise it quite recently. Um, Colossians 3, just to um, put out a few features to see how the logic of Easter works. In Colossians 2, you don't need to turn to it now, look, look at it later on, but in Colossians 2, uh, Paul says that we have died with Christ. We were buried with him in baptism, and we were raised with him from the dead. So having having gone with Jesus through death into resurrection life, we are now to die and put away the old things and live the new life. So Paul picks up in Colossians 3 saying, Since then you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedience And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now put away all of the following. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which has been renewed in knowledge according to the image of the creator. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another um, if, if if you have a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all things, all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you are called as one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I hope by doing that you can see the, the language of putting off and putting on. It's like new clothes that we're wearing, new Easter clothes to wear in the Christian life. Central to the chap, those verses is the idea of forgiveness. And our gospel reading is about Jesus instructing us how to learn to forgive. Let's stand for the gospel reading. The gospel reading is Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, Jesus answered. I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged 
and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I, I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. So Lord, please teach us the way of life, the way of life that you died and rose again to give to us, so that we may rejoice in you. For your name's sake. Amen. Do take a seat. Colossians 3 is on page 1184, 1184 in the Church Bibles. And as we saw in the reading, hopefully, that the, the way that Colossians 3 is talking about putting off one way of life and putting on a new way of life. It's about getting rid of some old clothes and putting on some new clothes. It's funny how um, various sayings or ideas in culture, uh, are kind of, they're so out of date you have to explain them to people. Yeah, if you ever say, well, I remember saying to, to Hannah, you're like a stuck record. And then realising, no, you can't say that anymore. No one, no one that age knows what a record is. I wonder how many people today know the idea of the Sunday best, your Sunday best clothes. Some of you might have grown up with your Sunday best, but not today so much. In my previous parish, I remember people saying, telling me about how some decades ago, uh, but living memory, and normally the family would run out of money by, by, by about Tuesday or Wednesday. And so dad's best Sunday suit would be sent to the pawn shop, P-A-W-N, not the other one, the pawn shop, um, and, and, um, and then to get a loan. And then when Friday payday came in, they'd go back to the shop and, and repurchase dad's best Sunday suit. And that was kind of a weekly ritual they had to get into because of their, um, their, their shortfall of income. But the idea of your Sunday best... Well, Paul wants us to wear our Easter best, but to wear them all the time. He wants to put, to put off the old clothes and put on the new clothes. We've died to the old, and just as Jesus left the grave clothes behind, so we're to leave the grave clothes of sin behind and walk in that newness of life. Put off anger, rage, malice, slander, so on. Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put on your Jesus is risen clothes. Or to, to, to change the analogy, put on the humanity in the image of God clothes. We are in the image of God, but the image has been marred in us. And Paul in Colossians has a few times where he talks about um, Jesus being the image of God, Jesus the true image. And as we put on the Jesus clothes, as we wear the Jesus is risen clothes, we wear the, the clothes of humanity in the image of God. Humanity that is in Christ reached the destiny that God has. God always wants to take humanity on a journey to grow and mature us. We failed because of sin, but Jesus has gone that journey. He is the fully mature image of God, and we can wear his clothes. It's about how we present ourselves, how we look in the world. Clothing is much more than warmth and modesty. We might wear clothes for status. Or even if we don't, we probably wear clothes that can match our social background, our class or something. We might wear clothing for a particular purpose. You've got your gardening clothes, maybe, or your painting clothes. All this clothing as a uniform that, uh, that unites. If everybody's wearing the same uniform in the school or a particular company or the workforce, there's a kind of a unity about that. And this whole chapter of Colossians 3, uh, Paul is saying, wear the clothes that show your status 
as God's beloved children. Wear the clothes that show your purpose to bring the grace of God to the world. Wear the clothes that show the unity of the church. That's a particular focus in verses 11 to 14, which we're looking at today. In Christ, this new self, verse 11, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So the primary, primary clothing we wear uh, wasn't, and for the church in, in Paul's time, he's saying don't primarily define yourself as Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free. That's not who you really are. Those things aren't unimportant, but they're not defining of who you are. Christ is all and in all. So church needs to be a place where we're not divided by, oh, they're the circumcised, they're the uncircumcised, they're the Gentiles, they're the Jews, they're the Welsh speakers, they're the English speakers, they're the better paid, they're the lower paid, they're the educated, they're the less educated. All these things need to be um, covered over with the Jesus is risen clothes. And part of the way we wear the right clothing says Paul is in our conduct, verse 12. So how are these, what does your wardrobe look like? What does your spiritual wardrobe look like? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's the Jesus is risen uniform. And with these clothes on, we bear with each other. They come patience, helping one another through the tough times. And we forgive each other when someone has a grievance. And then Paul emphasizes, verse 13, forgive as the Lord forgave you. As the Lord has forgiven, so you are also to forgive, is the translation um, that I had in mind. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. So these, these verses are all about these, the Jesus has risen clothes that bring about our unity, that show our unity rather, that show our purpose, our status as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. That's who you are in Christ, chosen, holy, dearly loved. Wear the clothes and in particular, this is our focus for the rest of the sermon. Learn to forgive. Practice forgiveness. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. And so the last, I won't define how many minutes because I've no idea. <laughs> Let's think about forgiveness. If the Lord, how, how did the Lord forgive us? How should we then forgive others? Because in conversation with people, in Bible studies or elsewhere, I know that learning to forgive others is a real wrestle. There's some real challenges involved with forgiving other people. And it's easy to fall for a very simplistic model. Kind of forgive and forget, no matter what harm they've done, even if they don't acknowledge it. And they the, the forgiveness the Bible talks about is more nuanced than just let people trample over you again and again and again and again. Or pretend they never hurt you in the first place. That is not what forgiveness is about in the Bible. So this might cause you to faint, but I've got five points of forgiveness. Hopefully they're shortish. Five points of forgiveness. First of all, what, did, what does forgiveness look like? Well, as Jesus died on the cross, what was our forgiveness looked like? Let me give you two metaphors. The covering of sin and the removal of debt. So the covering of sin. So that when we see somebody, or rather first and foremost, when God sees us, our sin has been covered over by the perfection of Jesus. So when God sees us in Christ, he doesn't see us say, oh, Tim, the sinner, 
with that kind of label on me, he sees me as Tim, the forgiven, holy, dearly loved child of God. And so part of forgiveness, and this is something we, we grow in, is when we see somebody, what comes to mind? How do we label them in our minds? Is it, uh, sorry, I'll say Caroline, but not, this is not a you know, covering up some sort of thing in the marriage. Is it Caroline who offended me yesterday? Or Hayden who forgot to do that thing that I asked you to do, which he hasn't at all. If anyone forgets, it's likely to be me. But if I go around seeing you, and when I see you, the first thing that comes to mind is that thing I count against you, that label I put on you, that's not forgiveness. Because when God looks at us in Jesus, he sees child, forgiven, holy. And even if someone has harmless in a way, that means we, we can't but think of them with that label. We choose time and time again to say, no, that's not how I'm going to treat them. If it's an issue within the church fellowship, then all of you carry the label holy, a chosen, holy and dearly loved. So if in some hypothetical situation you have offended me, I'm not to think of that. I'm to think of you as brother in Christ, sister in Christ, holy and dearly loved. That's how I should label you. Because that's how God has labeled us. So forgiveness is covering up, it's, it's kind of removing the one label and putting on a new label, a new title, as it were. And it's also, uh, forgiveness is the removal of debt. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins, modern version, trespasses, older version. Um, debts is the more, most literal word, is debt. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are debtors against us. That is, if I haven't forgiven you, when I see you, I'm expecting you to pay me in some way. I think you still owe me something. I want to exact some payment out of you. And forgiveness is the removal of debt. And that's what Christ has, God has done, given us the precious blood of Jesus to cancel our debts. So when we learn to forgive each other, think of those two metaphors. What comes to mind when you, what labels do you put on that person? And are you treating them that you want to keep exacting payment for the past? Now forgiveness means we label them as, if they're a Christian, child of God, they're not a Christian, at least loved by God or, or in the image of God or someone to be loved and shown mercy to. Label them with a forgiveness label. Do not exact, try to exact debts from them. So forgiveness is covering of sin and the removal of debt. Secondly, forgiveness, though it's the covering of sin, it's not the covering up of sin. Forgiveness does not hide what has happened. It heals and brings us into the light to forgive. Think of the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross, you know, what do we, we, we recognize that we are guilty. When we, when we hear the word of forgiveness, in a church service, what have we just done? Confessed our sins. Been open with God about our shortcomings. The cross, thank you David for doing the cross for us for, for Lent and Easter. Um, this cross tells us we are far more guilty than we realise. The cross tells us we have to come open before God and say we are worthy of death. But there's grace in the blood of Jesus. So forgiveness, God's forgiveness to us, doesn't hide or pretend we never sinned. God's forgiveness, the cross comes to us, or we come to the cross, and we're forced to recognise we are sinners. 
That's really important because when we forgive other people, that does not mean we pretend nothing ever happened. It might be that we treat them as if it never happened. We, we can't put that in the past, but we don't pretend. And it might be that in a particular situation, we have to rightly, following Christ's example, come to a moment of honesty and confession or bring them to a point of con- honesty and confession. You know, um, there, there have been so many people in, in, in history who, who were you know, with a terrible background and they come, they come to church, they hear the gospel, they hear about forgiveness and what do they do? They go to the police station and hand themselves in. They are open about what they've done. Not to get forgiveness, but because forgiveness calls us to honesty. And in a similar way, if somebody has harmed you or hurt you in some serious way, forgiveness is not the same as trusting them. Forgiveness is not the same as saying, you can come back in your life as if nothing ever happened and trample over me again. You do hear this in in some... um, it's some terrible pastoral stories I've heard, not of individuals, but of you know, kind of books about pastoral care, of yeah, a, a wife going to the elders of a church saying, my husband's beating me up, and, and the elders say, oh, forgive him and go back as if nothing's ever happened. That's wrong. That's wrong. Because it hasn't had that moment of clarity and honesty and uncovering the truth The forgiveness Jesus gives us is a truthful forgiveness, not a truth-hiding forgiveness. So if you are struggling with with forgiveness of somebody else, it might be. Just make sure you're not, you don't have the wrong end of the stick. There needs to be truth. The last three are briefer. As the Lord has forgiven us, so we to forgive others. Third, forgiveness is costly. (coughs) Forgiveness is costly. Jesus paid the price at the cost of his life. Whenever we forgive others, it will be costly. We don't have time to go into the the, the parable from Matthew 18, but do you hear Jesus' logic in that parable? Uh, God has forgiven us a colossal debt. So we're to forgive the smaller, but still real, debts of others. Forgiveness is costly. Fourth, the last two go together, really, the last two points. Forgiveness is something we offer, but I think reconciliation requires a true response. There's, I've been reading a number of articles about forgiveness in preparation for today, and and there's different ways of talking about this, this kind of reality that it is basically, is forgiveness unconditional? Is forgiveness unconditional? And it's kind of yes and no, or, or maybe define your terms. There was a, a father whose uh, daughter was killed in, in, by an IRA bomb, the, um, I think the Enniskillen bombing, some years ago. And um, I think uh, kind of, he was interviewed shortly afterwards and he said publicly, I forgive those who murdered my daughter. And a very powerful act of forgiveness. And without taking away from that in the slightest, there's something about offering forgiveness to those who've harmed us, but it's not the full same as full reconciliation. I think we can offer some form of forgiveness freely without condition, but reconciliation does require the guilty partner, uh, guilty person, to respond rightly. So we can, by prayer, maybe with the help of other Christians around us, by meditating on the cross, we can. Offer forgiveness. And when we offer forgiveness, we want the best for that person. We want them to know Jesus. We want them to be know the, the forgiveness of the cross. 
We might want justice to be done, not because we want to exact our reward, but because justice is important. So there's, there is a forgiveness that is unconditional in the sense that we offer it freely. That is what God has offered us in Jesus at the cross. But reconciliation requires the guilty to turn back as well. Jesus has already died. He's already shed his blood for you and for me before we were born. So the forgiveness we're offered is unconditional in that sense. It's freely given. But we receive that forgiveness. We're restored to God as we turn back to him and acknowledge our guilt before him and trust and believe. Reconciliation does require the guilty parts to a guilty person, guilty party in the situation to, to respond rightly. Romans 12 verse 18 says, um, in as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. And I love that kind of realism. In as much as it depends on you, it doesn't all depend on you. There's some people who never respond. And therefore, you can never live at peace with them because they've never done anything. You've done what you can, but they never respond to it. And so forgiveness that we find in Jesus is free and unconditional at the start, but it calls for a response which brings about full reconciliation. So I hope that's helped us think through the, what forgiveness looks like in a bit more detail. So they're not practicing simplistic forgiveness, which can be harmful, particularly if you're being told, oh, you just must forgive. You must forgive. That can be a real burden, actually, on some people. No true understanding of forgiveness means we understand how there must be truth and honesty and there must be full... Recon to, be, to be reconciled, the guilty party must also respond properly to the offer of forgiveness and the grace found in that forgiveness. And we as a church are people who practice that so that our Easter clothes, our Christ is risen uniform, can be seen in the world. Our Jesus is risen clothes need to be clothes that have compassion, humility, gentleness, patience, and forgiveness. And as we practice this in our lives, in our church fellowship, so we wear the Jesus is risen clothing for the world to see. So the world might come and believe and find forgiveness as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help us to uh, think through deeply what it means to practice forgiveness, to walk in truth and light, and to wear the Jesus clothes of the resurrection. May we live as your chosen people, holy and dearly loved, that many others may believe, and we might show your glory, the glory of forgiveness at the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.